afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Today is a day dedicated to the memory and legacy of the man who is considered our country's formative figure in the fight for civil rights. As we honor the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King, we note that an important piece of history was recently brought to light at the University of Vermont. Ironically, it was a footnote in the archives at Middlebury College that led researchers to a long forgotten member of UVM's class of 1838. As Rebecca Gollin tells us, UVM President Tom Sullivan recently led a celebration to recognize, honor, and set the proper place in history for the forgotten graduate. Good afternoon, and thank you. <clears throat> One University of Vermont remarks. graduate recently received some long overdue recognition. He was, we know, a very strong advocate for education, and particularly education for African Americans. Subject. UBM President Tom Sullivan led the celebration and dedication to honor the long ago graduate. A plaque on the wall at the Waterman Building and a nearby honorific chair will remain to commemorate a man who was ahead of his time. Only one year after his graduation from here, he delivered one of the most impassionate and inspired speeches history recalls to over 5,000 people in attendance at an abolitionist conference in New York City. Andrew Harris was a member of UVM's class of 1838. He was one of 24 graduates that year. A few years older than most of his classmates, Harris was already a community and religious leader in Troy, New York by the time of his graduation. What set him apart was not his age or his accomplishments, however. It was the color of his skin. I was alerted to Andrew Harris by my friend Bob Buckeye at the Middlebury College Library and uh, there was a, uh, a biography of him uh, in the, the Black Abolitionist Papers, which is a, a great reference source on uh, 19th century abolitionists. And uh, so I looked that up and did a little research here and found that yes indeed he was enrolled at UVM um, and had been largely forgotten. Harris was so forgotten that until about two decades ago, George Washington Henderson, who graduated in 1877, had been celebrated as UVM's first black graduate, with a portrait in the Waterman Building and a cafe named for him in the university's student center. Although Henderson was incredibly accomplished, Harris defied the odds by graduating nearly 40 years earlier in a nation where slavery was not yet abolished and the Civil War wouldn't be fought for more than 20 years. There are no known pictures of Harris. He was a leader. He was an ordained minister, um, as well as he was an abolitionist. And um, he really believed in equality, and he really wanted full citizenships, particularly um, for African Americans at that time. And so um, his, his, his hard work, his dedication, and his passion um, really, sort of really stood out. Um, Wanda Heading Grant is the vice president place. for human um, resources, again, my, diversity, my and multicultural affairs at UVM. At that time. She says that Harris came to UVM at a time that the university was on the cutting edge of social inclusion, while still participating in the racism that was so pervasive in that era. President Wheeler, who admitted Harris despite the protests of much of the student body, was himself a devoted colonizationist. That's to say, that although Wheeler opposed slavery, he also believed that slaves, as well as the free colored population of the United States, should be sent back to their native lands. If you can imagine in thinking around, you know, 1838 graduating and the time before that and what, um, you know, our society was like at that time and, and to a certain degree we're still working on a lot of issues, but uh, to be denied access and equality um, because of the color of one's skin and to um, also not be able to um, be a part of what it really meant to be a student in higher learning, um, to always be sort of set aside in some kind of way. I'm not sure how he was able to endure that. UVM was not Harris's first choice. He was first rejected by both Union College and Middlebury. We don't know exactly why he uh, 
continued on to Burlington, but uh, uh, perhaps he had heard that he might have a better reception here. Harris's difficulties did not end once he began classes as a sophomore in November of 1835. Many of his classmates never warmed up to his presence, and his name is not listed in the catalog of students, which is one reason he remained unknown for so long. In addition, his name is listed out of order on many records, last instead of alphabetical. And Harris's final farewell from UVM at his graduation may have been the greatest insult. Apparently, his classmates took a final stand against his presence. According to an account from an attendee that was later printed in the anti-slavery newspaper The Liberator, Harris, quote, was not permitted to speak or to come upon the platform to receive his diploma, but was obliged to take it one side. The class declared that if he came upon the stage, they would have nothing to do with the exercises. In addition, Harris was not allowed to deliver his prepared speech, which was required by each graduate at the time. The fact that he came here while slavery was still uh, uh, existing in the South um, and uh, became an active abolitionist himself um, really uh, said something about his character. Can you imagine Burlington, Vermont at that time? A small, bustling waterfront town surrounded by farms, deep woods, mill towns, and a population that didn't include many who looked like Andrew Harris. After leaving UVM, Harris expanded his already substantial role as a community, religious, and political leader delivering fiery anti-slavery speeches to increasingly large crowds and becoming an ordained minister. He moved to Philadelphia in 1839 and became pastor at a small church in the city. Harris was making a name for himself, all was going well, until November of 1841, when Harris came down with a fever and died a few weeks later, just 27 years old. We might have had um, much more to say about Andrew Harris and all the great things that he would have accomplished and um, done to make this a better place for all of us um, in terms of equality and equity and access. A promising life cut tragically short and a history finally put right at UVM. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca. As Rebecca noted, Andrew Harris died before the nation went to war over the issue of slavery. And when the war came, thousands of Vermonters died in support of a slavery-free country. To learn more about Vermont's Civil War history, we join Howard Coffin at the Vermont State House. We're in the Vermont House of Representatives, perhaps the most famous room in all of Vermont. And it looks today almost exactly as it did at the time of the Civil War the same chandelier, the same seats, and the same speaker's rostrum. In 1862, John Phelps came back from Louisiana, having resigned from the army after General Benjamin Butler refused to let him enlist black men into the army. He came back and he spoke here to a rousing reception. He said, the sun never looked down upon a greater evil than American slavery. In ruling this great nation of slaves, we have to a degree become enslaved ourselves. Many of the things said here had a ring of human freedom. Perhaps the greatest moment in this room happened on May 9th, 1865, when the legislature met in an extra session to consider whether to ratify the 13th Amendment, which outlawed slavery. The vote was 169 to nothing, and when the vote was announced, a 100-gun salute was fired on the State House lawn. Republican Governor Erastus Fairbanks asked the legislature to appropriate a half a million dollars to begin the war effort. But that wasn't enough. 
according to many, including Representative Stephen Thomas, a Democrat from West Fairley. He rose to say this, until this rebellion shall have been put down, I have no friends to reward and no enemies to punish. And I trust that the whole strength and power of Vermont, both of men and money, will be put into the field to sustain the government. Thomas would go on to lead the 8th Vermont Regiment in the Civil War, including in its suicidal and brave stand at Cedar Creek. Soldier reunions were held in this hall. In years after the Civil War, Stephen Thomas came back and he spoke of his comrades no longer with him. Their memory is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. They need no eulogy, for it is written in letters of living light. Abraham Lincoln had used the analogy of gold and silver to talk about the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, how they should always be considered together because the Declaration of Independence guaranteed that all men are created equal and should be treated equal, he was talking about human freedom. Here in the Senate chamber, all the seats are numbered. This has been called the most beautiful room in Vermont, and it may well be. After the Civil War, a war record was an essential thing to a political career and a lot of veterans got elected to the Senate. In fact, some 95 Civil War veterans served in this room. The numbers haven't changed. Here in seat 22 sat George Grenville Benedict, longtime editor of the Burlington Free Press, who won a Medal of Honor at Gettysburg. In the seat beside him, seat 23, Wheelock Vasey served from Springfield. Wheelock Vasey commanded the 16th Vermont Regiment at Gettysburg in the flank attack on Pickett's Charge and then turned his men around and launched another flank attack on a supporting Confederate attack. Long after the war, he became national commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, the great veterans organization. And right down at the end of this row, at the last desk, it was occupied by Redfield Proctor. Redfield Proctor, who led the 15th Vermont Regiment to Gettysburg, who later served as Secretary of War. Beloved by his soldiers, he welcomed them all to Proctor for a great reunion years after the war. In Proctor, he had founded the Vermont Marble Company. Vermont, of course, has a remarkable Civil War history, but it is nowhere as present, perhaps, as in the Cedar Creek Room of the State House. And an old friend of mine is with us today, David Sheets, the curator of the State House. David, there's some new things in this old room. There are. We've never been able to truly bring alive perhaps the two parts of the State House that resonate with the Civil War the most. And that's this room, the Cedar Creek Room, which of course has this magnificent painting behind us that was commissioned for the State House as perhaps Vermont's most important Civil War memorial. And then the flag collection, which we've worked for decades to conserve but in the aftermath of that, not been able to do much with the, ca the empty cases. So now we have these glorious uh, exhibits that actually, uh, with this significant anniversary for the Civil War, are coming alive in a new way for the State House, and we're very, very proud of them. In this room, we've never had a very effective way of explaining this this magnificent painting to the public unless they had the benefit of a tour. 
Um, we get so many casual visitors to the State House that we needed a more active way of bringing this to life. And as you know, we have now these wonderful stanchions in front of the painting that explain the battle and also explain the significant story of how Julian Scott actually painted the battle for this building. Our thanks to both Howard Coffin and State House curator David Sheets. And thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.